Okay, we are recording. Thank you. I'm gonna wait a little bit to see if anyone comes in. Oh, no one likes us anymore. This agenda must not be as interesting as some. So I think I've probably waited long enough and no one seems to be coming in. So here we go. Um, Carol, uh, can you figure out how to get rid of this calendar thing? You're, you're not, you're not, there you go, Pat. <laughs> um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this November 17th, 2022 regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order at 4.31 p.m. pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. This time I'm going to make sure everyone can be heard and we can, uh, everyone can hear us and we can hear them. So I'm just going to call the roll, starting with Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. And we are waiting on Shalini. We will note and check on her if and when she arrives. I believe she's intending on being here today. Um, with that, um, we are going to move directly into our um, public hearing. So bear with me as I read all of the stuff for this one. It is 4.32 p.m. And in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this continued public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. And this is where I get to read a really long sentence. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 3 use regulations to delete existing use categories in Section 3.352.0, Class 1 Restaurant, Cafe, Lunchroom, Cafeteria, or Similar Place, Section 3.352.1, Class 2 Restaurant or Bar, and Section 3.352.2, Class 3 Drive Up Restaurant, and to add the following use categories, Section 3.352.0, Restaurant, Cafe, Bar with Food, or Other Similar Food and Beverage Establishment, where food is available at all times, Section 3.352.1, bar with no food served. Section 3.352.2, nightclub. And section 3.352.3, any of the above food and drink establishments with occupant, occupant capacity of more than 250 occupants and to add standards and conditions for these uses. And to amend Article 5, accessory uses, sections 5.041, 5.042, and 5.043 to allow seasonal outdoor dining as an accessory use to the principal use authorized by section 3.352. 3, to allow outdoor furnishings associated with such use to remain in place between November 1 and April 1, as long as the use is active and operational, to remove the prohibition on outdoor heating and cooling devices, and to allow live or pre-recorded entertainment as an accessory use to a principal use authorized by Section 3.3, and to delete reference to drive-in restaurants. And to amend Article 11, Administration and Enforcement, to rearrange the paragraphs describing when site plan review is not required, and to clarify the requirements and process for granting administrative approval, and to amend Article 12, definitions, by clarifying Section 12.05, bar, and by deleting Section 12.11, drive up restaurant, and any associated renumbering that may be necessary. While I was reading all of that, Shalini joined us. So Shalini, can you hear us? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, um, we are going to go into an update from the planning staff and then we'll continue with questions from the board um, from the committee and then questions from the public then comment public comment then any other additional questions before we move on to potentially closing the hearing so for the update i'm going to go to chris um, we'll get an update on where the planning board was and what changes have been proposed between the last hearing and this hearing i will report on the planning board's vote um, and then I'll ask Nate to um, report on the details because there have been changes made since the last meeting. So the planning board met last night and closed its public hearing on this topic. Um, they voted five in favor of the whole package of changes. Um, one member abstained, and that was Janet McGowan, um, because she had some 
concerns about the changes to Article 5. And one person wasn't there because she was momentarily absent doing something else for about 45 minutes to an hour. So she returned for the rest of the meeting, but she wasn't there for that portion of the meeting. That was Karen Winter. But five members of the board did vote in favor of these changes. And um, now I will turn this over to Nate to um, let you know what the changes were since the last time we met. Nate? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Uh, Nate Malloy, for those in the audience that may be watching, um, a planner with the town. Um, Athena, could I have uh, screen sharing turned on? There you go. You should be all set. All right. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I'll enlarge this in a minute. <clears throat> um, you know, we didn't change. So staff, you know, considered um, you know, the various comments we've met with some citizens since the previous hearing uh, and the planning board also met. And so, um, you know, we haven't, we haven't changed any language in um, articles 5, 11, or 12. And so um, what we did change though was the use chart. And so what's visible here is um, what's being proposed. Uh, and let me just zoom in a little bit. Um, What's in blue is what had been changed, you know, uh, before the last hearing. So you know, we added a nightclub as defined by the state building code. What's in green are recent changes from uh, the last hearings of the CRC and planning board. And so, you know, there had been a discussion right here. I'm under uh, the larger uh, establishments, and rather than 250 occupants, um, as a you know, it could be staff and um, patrons were saying really there's a mac maximum occupancy of 200 patrons and so that's a change and so uh, it's cleaner than um, you know it's both inside and outside it could be seating or standing so if there's a bar it's really what their the capacity is for patrons and so staff can vary it could be you know five staff it could be 15 staff at an establishment and so really it's the number of patrons we found would be um, a little more relevant and easier to understand I'm just going to move across the, the use chart here. Um, in the BN district, uh, we had proposed that a bar with no food and nightclub in a larger establishment could be allowed by special permit. And we're now proposing that they be prohibited. So there, it's a no use. So those are, um, you know, it's an N. We're st we still would allow a restaurant, cafe, or bar with food or other similar establishment as a site plan or view with the condition um, that's down below that still limits the total number of seats to 30. Um, you know, an alcohol service has to stop at nine and there's a, you know, a, a, a perimeter buffer from a residential use in a residential district. So we're, you know, we're really taking out the possibility of some more impactful uses. And in the standards and conditions, you know, there's this, these are a lot of standards and conditions that we don't have in place now. And so, you know, what we've done is we've added some language uh, under the management plan and so we've, we've, you know, we put in language that there be specific management strategies uh, for alcohol service, such as hours of operation and patrons leaving the establishment. And so really, you know, the, the management plan will have fields to be completed. And one will say, you know, uh, you know if alcohol served, uh, and it can have a number of things, you know, describe your hours of operation, how patrons will leave the establishment. So a planning board member asks, well, what does that mean? And it's really what it, what it is, is, you know, at closing time, how are you going to manage people leaving? Is it um, you have a staff member on the sidewalk? Would you stagger um, groups of people leaving? So instead of having a whole stream leave in two minutes, you you um, you know you have different uh, groups leave and you you stagger the time. So uh, we found that you know staff has found over the years that the management, especially at closing time, is really important. So we are you know including that as you know another requirement in the management plan. Um, you know, we did add, um, you know, um, strategies to mitigate um, adjacent properties from noise and other impacts. And that was added previously, but I just want to point that out that, again, that's a requirement. So, you know, uh, whether it's through a public hearing or administrative approval, an applicant has to respond to this. And so, you know, the staff can say, well, if, if you leave it empty, well, what does that mean? And usually, you know, it becomes a conversation with a potential owner. Um, and, you know, we try to help them uh, right, what what you know, what they could use for strategies or methods to accomplish that. Um, I guess the the a big one is number eleven. Uh, there should be no alcohol service after one a.m. 
this isn't much of a change um, in terms of common practice. So the zoning board or the board of license commissioners has been um, having 1 a.m. as a designated end time for alcohol service. It's never been um, codified in a bylaw or a policy before. So this is something that we're recommending. Um, you know, like I said, it's it's just kind of following along with what has been the conditions in the in the special permits and what the board of license commissioners have, you know, what their practice is. Um, and so really those are the changes, you know, article five, 11 and 12 remain the same. Um, I can take questions, I guess here, if we have any questions about just, you know, article three right now. Jennifer. I'm just curious. So um, it's basically you can't serve alcohol after one, but the establishment can stay open till two. Right. And so typically the zoning board would allow, you know, an hour after alcohol service for a restaurant to close and clean up. So, um, you know, we're not establishing a closing time necessarily. It's really when alcohol service can end. Um, right. Okay. So I, I have two questions um, and I'll start with the one related to alcohol service. Um, are there other establishments or use categories in this bylaw that could potentially have alcohol service or is alcohol service limited to these four use categories at all and i ask that because if we're putting in a condition of 1 a.m um that we're looking for for use categories um or for establishments if there's other use categories that could get an alcohol license for service would they be able to get one later than one? Like, would we want some sort of to look at unifying that somehow? And I just don't know whether there's like some other use category that could potentially end up with a serving, you know, an alcohol license to serve alcohol. Sure. No, that's a really good question. So, you know, the way the bylaw works, um, you know, there's an Amherst zoning bylaw. If, if a use comes in, say like the Drake, uh, it's the building commissioner's job as the zoning enforcement officer to, put it in the cl most closely related category or use classification. And so, uh, for instance, you know, is it a restaurant? Is it a bar? Is it a performance space? And so there could be, you know, some use that uh, may not fit nicely into these that would may, may serve alcohol and they'd have to go through a public process with the board of license, license commissioners. And so, um, you know, I don't know if they have it in the rules and regulations at 1 a.m. is their end time, but that's what they've done for every establishment. So, um, you know, there are some existing uh, older special permits for, uh, you know, maybe three or four establishments where they can serve after one. And so, you know, as you said, an existing special permit doesn't go away if the zoning bylaw changes. So if, if somehow that establishment, uh, you know, has to have their permit um, amended, whether it's you know, because they expanded or some, you know, something happened, they want to change their uh, service, then, uh, you know, this, this condition would then apply or could be applied. But yeah, I mean, to your point, there could be another use classification that could serve alcohol uh, that would then be subject to, you know, the Board of Licensing Commissioners and their conditions and not necessarily these standards and conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll go to Pat and then I'll ask my other question. Okay, mine's, uh, I think, quick. I'm curious to get a visual in my brain about a, a space that has 200 pa patrons and staff or 250 patrons and staff. Could you give me sight a, 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 a place? Right, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, Johnny's Tavern, for in instance, has, um, you know, occupancy of around 180. Okay, that's helpful. And so- and that's plus patron, uh, plus staff. So yeah, the, the minor setting is that that's total occupancy, both inside and outside and including patrons and staff. And so okay. the, what, what we have found though, is like I said, staff could vary. So it could be that, you know, on any night they have, you know, five staff, but maybe on a busy night, they have 15. And so when we change, you know, when we're recommending changing this to 200 patrons, it's really, it's easier to define that, you know, so the patron limit is not the occupancy limit that you'll see posted on the um, on the building, right? That's a building code or fire code, occupant load. And so we're really saying 200 patrons, excluding staff. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so my next question is back to um, condition 10. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like 
I, I keep going back to this one. Um, and so last time we talked about that 100 foot limit as being really limiting within the BN. Um, and now that I've seen, now that there's been changes so that bars, nightclubs, and large establishments can't be in the BN at all, so now we're just looking at restaurants, pure restaurants. Um, it, is there a reason why we're keeping the 100 foot limit versus, since we've also added a condition 11 about alcohol service and there's already an alcohol service, versus just saying in the BN, because we're worried about noise, particularly, BN establishments can't be open past, say, 9 or 9.30. What, what, why is the foot limit preferable to just establishing an end time limit within the bylaw in the BN? Yeah, I think the when the BN was created, it was a you know meant to be a transitional zone, uh, pretty closely integrated with residential neighborhoods, and so you know this type of uh, buffer was put in there um, really as a a way to try to balance you know non residential uses and residential uses. I you know you know my thought is that the hundred foot buffer is really um, somewhat irrelevant when it comes to noise impacts. I mean, noise can travel much further than hundred feet. And so, um, you know, the planning board, they didn't really discuss this condition that much. I think if we were to have, you know, um, you know, modify it, I think the hundred feet could be waived or, you know, eliminated, you know, the, the alcohol service and the, and the number of seats really is something that we find would be more helpful in terms of managing an establishment, right? So if you're limiting the size and you know the when the alcohol can stop serving, that that helps with the management and operation of an establishment. You know, I don't think it's, you know, I guess if if you know if you're really worried about having noise really late in the neighborhood, then maybe you'd have a you know an end time of the establishment as opposed to end time for alcohol service. But that's something that you know we haven't considered or the planning board didn't consider. Okay. Thank you. Shalini. Yeah, uh, first, just to comment that I really appreciate that, you know, the staff looking at this so carefully and offering these uh, recommendations to correct some of the problems or to manage some of the problems like the, uh, you know, that uh, number point number five. And so it, that's, it just makes me feel that you're really putting a lot of thought and taking all the considerations of people into mind, the residents. Um, my question was about the BN, where there shall be no more than a total of 30 seats, both indoor and outdoor. And I was wondering if you've received any feedback from businesses, because I don't know if it's like tenable, like, is that feasible to open a restaurant, given the high rents, and then limit the capacity of that? And so any kind of feedback we've heard from actual restaurants? No, although, you know, vacant spaces may indicate that these conditions are somewhat of a deterrent from opening, you know, a similar establishment there. So, um, you know, I think some of it was just in the BN, there's a small number of properties and it may have just been that, you know, at the time, you know, staff would have done an assessment and said, well, the spaces aren't, aren't too big, 30 seats seems reasonable, mm -hmm. uh, but it may be that um, you know it it could limit you know someone from considering that if they really you know that is not that you know it is not a lot of seats, right? Yeah, because I feel like if you put other constraints that you're already suggesting about alcohol and time and all of that, um, I don't know if this is a good uh, limit to impose. That's going to stop and not make it attractive for people to come there. Especially if it's like a cafe or something like that. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Yeah, I guess following on Shalini, like with the lumber yard, that was in the BN, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Or, no, that was in the, B, uh, I think the Business Village Center. So I think. Okay. So yeah. the, so the, the young, something like the lumber yard could come back where it is, was. Right, right. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, um, right. So south of Main Street in that location, you know, uh, east of Dickinson is considered um, business village center. And so BN is really, 
you know, um, the brick building across from the Emily Dickinson Museum uh, that has a few shops in it. And then, you know, the Amherst Media lots and some properties north of Main Street and then the VFW site. So there's not many properties. And then on the corner of High Street, I guess. Um, but there's not many properties that are zone BN. Okay, thank you. I didn't realize that the, um, uh, you know, where the uh, Hope and Feathers then had a different zoning than, right. um, okay. Right. So Hope and Feathers is, is neighborhood business, right? right? Okay, thank you. Um, with that, can you give us an idea of, my, my question is, can you give us an idea of a, a size of, say, a 30 seat or less establishment that's already in town, it doesn't have to be in the BN, um, and something that's like 50 seats or 60 seats? If you give me a second, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to, as with Pat, like get an idea of what are we saying when we say 30 seats? Like, what couldn't we have there if we go up to 50, yeah. but we can't because we said 30 type things? Right. So quickly, the, um, you know, like Pita Pockets in downtown is 20, about 20 um, occupant capacity. Uh, El Comolito or House of Teriyaki in North Amherst is, is 56, around between 55 and 60. So that's, you know, that's 50. So Pita Pockets is 20. Um, I would say El Comolito is 80. And so, you know, Pita Pockets is, is, a, is a pretty small space. And so not much bigger than that. So if you had, you know, three tables outside, four tables outside, you'd be, um, you know, at, could be over, you know, if it was four, four seats a table, you're over 30 seats then. Um, what is Coronation Cafe in the old Bart's place? Do we know? Um, I, I haven't. I have an email with a spreadsheet. I could just, um, I, I'll take, I could take a minute. I'd have to look and see exactly okay. what that is. Um, Thank you. Pat, did you have a question? Sort of, uh, we had one resident uh, who sent um, an email asking us to uh, wait on article five accessory uses until the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission studies are completed. And I'm not sure I agree with that, but I was wondering when, does anybody have an idea when the planning commission studies will be completed? Yeah, I think it's um, it's not quite related. So huh. you know, we're, we have a technical assistance grant with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and staff's been working with them to come up with zoning for um, temporary uses, gotcha. which is not the same as accessory uses. So, you know, right now maybe, because we don't really have a definition or category for temporary uses, some people might think it's the same, but really we're trying to come up with new zoning for temporary uses. So, you know, if they, someone wants to have a pop-up shop or have food trucks come in, you know, every other week for the summer, then that's considered say a temporary use. So it's, it's not uh, necessarily related to what we're proposing here. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming that's much. what the reference was to not, I'm not sure of any other, any other work with uh, PVPC. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, you had your hand up. Was that answered by Nate, what you were going to say? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, without the hands for now, I'm going to let Nate do that. On, on our, since this is a public hearing, we actually have to say we're going to the public. So while Nate looks up, and because we don't have any hands right now, um, I'm going to formally transition to any questions from the public. And with that, I'm going to state that there are no public or is no public in attendance. And then I'm going to transition to public comment. <laughs> and again, state that there is no public in attendance, but that we have formally made time um, in this meeting to, to have public comment and public questions. Um, yeah. And so with that, we are back to board um, questions or comments and anything the planning board would like, the planning staff, not the planning board, would like to add to um, this hearing before we vote on whether to close it. So Nate has, I know that didn't give you a lot of time since no one's in the public, but did it give you enough? <laughs> it did, it did. So uh, Coronation Cafe is at about 50, um, you know, 50 uh, persons as an occupant capacity. I found that Lily's, um, 
restaurant, you know, on North Pleasant Street, that's that's about 30. Um, and so, yeah, I was trying to find some smaller, um, most of them are. <laughs> so 30 is really small. Yeah, uh, Momo's is 36, right, around 40. So I think, I mean, most of them, I'm looking, I'm just looking at the spreadsheet now, and most of them are like, you know, 40s to mid 40s to 60, right? So they're not very few. I think there's two or three below 30. And that, that was, um, and that's, uh, you know, right now the list has about 70 establishments, so. Thank you for that. I'm gonna remind our committee, we will discuss any potential amendments outside of the public hearing is the way we do it at CRC. Um, we try to get all of the questions and any information we need in during the public hearing, um, which obviously also implies maybe things we might want to change when we get out of the public hearing. Um, are there any further questions or comments um, to be made at this time? Seeing none, um, I nope. will- Pam. Oh, sorry, I missed you, Pam. Pam. That's okay, I just popped it up. Um, so we're just talking right now about section three. Uh, no, we can talk about the whole, all, all the changes. Okay, well, so maybe we could ask Nate if he wants to describe any of the changes that have come up since the last time we heard it on the other articles, 5, 11, and 12. He mentioned there are no other changes in those articles from what we saw two weeks ago. Uh, okay, so do we hold our discussion till after we close the hearing then? Discussion on recommendations is after we close the hearing. Any questions um, get made now? Well, my hand back up then. Sure, Pam. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the planning board meeting and um, I would, I think it would be helpful for folks to hear from the staff um, what some of the safeguards are for any changes in alcohol service and or hours of operation um, because that was one of the primary issues uh, when people thought that somehow we're relaxing um, or relaxing restrictions that would allow, you know, more volume, more alcohol service, more, you know, longer hours of service, especially in uh, adjacent to neighborhoods. So I wonder if, if, Nate, you could talk a little bit about what some of the safety valves are, such as Changes going to the Board of Health. I mean, I don't mean Board of Health, I mean Board of License Commissioner. Right. Yeah. So I can, you know, what, um, you know, quickly, the way the use chart works, right? A restaurant um, in a, or a bar with food, you know, are, is by site plan review. And just quickly, that if, say, one wants to stay open later and just serve alcohol, that becomes a bar. And so, according to the use chart, they would then have to apply for a special permit. So they would need two permits in place. And uh, the Board of License Commissioners reviews any changes to alcohol service, whether it's new or existing. So if an establishment serves alcohol till 10 p.m. and they wanna then stay open till midnight or later, that's, that requires a public hearing uh, through the Board of License Commissioners. And so, you know, abutters are noticed, it's advertised in the paper and it's a public hearing, just like it would happen with another regulatory board or committee. And so uh, the Board of License Commissioners can place conditions on the service of alcohol you know, it's not as broad as site plan review, but anything related to alcohol service, whether that's uh, closing times, whether it's managing or, op, you know, how the operations are in terms of the storage of the alcohol, how much is served. And so uh, the Board of License Commissioners really reviews any changes to alcohol service, whether mm -hmm. or not the, the project um, goes through site plan review or, you know, administrative approval. The Board of License Commissioners will always review changes to alcohol service. Um, additionally, you know, Pam did mention the Board of Health, and so, you know, any establishment that is trying to serve food, unless it's prepackaged, and that's a bar with no food, any, anything that's serving food really has to have a kitchen, and that also requires Board of Health approval, and so, um, you know, in the accessory uses in, in Section 5, we're now saying that outdoor dining and other uses can be accessory to any principal use in, in the use chart, and there was some discussion at the planning board about whether or not you know, that's 
that's appropriate or it could be really limited to just food and drink establishments. And, you know, we were saying that um, staff was saying, we, we don't, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't gotten to that item yet. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yep. Stick with the first one. That I'll was, pause. that was, that was, if there are um, in, in businesses that come in and establish, you know, cutoff time, say at 1130 and then, and then later want to extend their hours of operation and I gave the example of the pizza place right down here, which is ringed by, you know, numerous neighbors. Many years ago, they appealed to the to the um, uh, select board to change uh, their hours of operation, and it was it was pretty clear that that there was having having a, an operation like that given you know doors cl closing people talking in the parking lot etc was was a good thing to 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 pause or to to shut down at 11:30 so that that request to extend to to 1:30 in the morning was not allowed at the time so the same situation could arise obviously here where um an existing business wants to make a a pretty major shift like that in their hours of operation or alcohol. What struck me was that in fact, there will still be a public hearing by the Board of License Commissioners. And that's kind of for me, the, the key element that there is still some public input and notification of abutters. Uh, Jennifer. Uh, so yeah, I wasn't able to be at the planning board meeting last night. So I was just wondering, was there a question about the timing of, of the public hearing in the process? No. No. Okay. No. And Pam, did you have it sounded like you had questions about some of the other sections, in, including I don't know, 11, I guess it is, or section five, accessory uses, um, and then the administrative approval. So why don't you ask them now? Okay, so it's 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 not really a question, I guess. Well, maybe it is. Um, and the question is, um, no, it's not It's not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> okay. Um, any further questions from the committee versus comments on where a recommendation might go? Um, See none at this time, we should take a motion either to continue or to close. So would anyone like to make a motion? Um, Pat, you raised your hand. You're muted, Pat. I move that we adjourn the public for, uh, meeting. You're moving to close? Yes. The public hearing. Um, is there a second? Second, Second. Shalini. I think Shalini just beat you, Jennifer. Um, any discussion on the motion to close the public hearing? Pat, your hand is still raised. Yeah, that's because I'm old and decrepit. Gotcha. We'll we'll move to a vote then. Um, and that gotcha was in no way commenting or agreeing with that comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Shalini. Yes. Uh, Pat. Aye. Mandy is an I, Pam. Okay. Yeah. And Jennifer? Yes. Okay, we are closed on the public hearing. That means we move to action items. Um, the action items, the first one is to talk about our recommendations and discussions on these changes related to this. So, Pam. Uh, I too want to say thanks to the staff for putting all of this, these great packages together and recognizing that it wasn't just, you know, an article 14 change, but in fact, it's, you know, 5, 11, 12, 3, um, and that the pieces obviously are all interrelated. Um, I think my, my support of um, article 11 is, is you know, is, is pretty consistent. Um, I, again, was reassured by the fact that whether it's site plan review or or special permit or administrative review of a project if there were changes to ex extend the hours of operation or 
the service of alcohol that there would still be public hearing run by somebody other than the planning board or, or ZBA perhaps, um, but there still would be a public hearing. And that is a really key item in my, in my book. Um, in section five, um, I've been really grappling with the with the opening up of um, allowing or or recognizing accessory uses um, such as seasonal outdoor dining and the live or recorded entertainment to essentially any any principal use. Um, I was I heard in the discussion at the planning board that um, an accessory use, and maybe Nate can back me up on this, but an accessory use is traditional and and uh, and sort of usual and and traditional association of um, an accessory use to the primary use. That said, I, would still be much more comfortable if it said um, in the first paragraph 5.041 as an accessory use to um, any establishment selling food or drink. It it keeps the it keeps the umbrella a little or the belt a little bit closer to these um, primary uses of food and drink establishments without being too explicit. It could be a bakery because it sells food or drink. Um, it could be a gas station with a with a um, a food um, sales area. And I'm not sure that there are that many other primary uses, given the how many that we have in our bylaw, um, that really need to be uh, allowed for. So I'd I'd like to see a just a slight tightening of that. Um, as I said before, to any establishment selling food or drink. And I think that's that's my last comment. Nate, do you have any, or Chris, do you have anything on, in response to that? Thanks for sharing the screen on bringing that up. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I, this is, yeah, quickly. So, you know, this is the beginning of Article 5, which we're not proposing to change, but it says, you know, any use which is in Hampshire County customarily accessory and incidental to a permitted or principal use. Um, we shall be allowed on the same lot. Um, and so, you know, that, that phrase is really important. And so when we're going to what we're proposing to change in Article 5, here's the changes. This is to that retail and business areas. Um, you know, Right now, we're currently in the bylaw, it's what's in red that's being, uh, has strike through. So seasonal outdoor dining is allowed. Um, if it's a, accessory to a restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, refreshment stand, drive up, fast food eatery, or similar eating establishment, bakery, deli, deli similar establishment for the production and sale of food or beverage on the property, or a retail store or convenience store selling prepared and packaged food or beverages on the premises. Um, and so that's right now, outdoor dining could be accessory to any of those. Um, you know, the previous, what we're proposing is in bold is uh, any principal use authorized by section three and subject to the same review as it. So if the principal use needs a special permit to have an accessory use as outdoor dining would require a special permit. So accessory uses aren't necessarily allowed um, through administrative approval to start an accessory use is always a permit whether it's site plan review or special permit. Um, you know, so the one abstaining vote at the planning board had the kind of the same kind of concerns that, wow, all of a sudden, you know, we could have outdoor dining to any principal use. So it could be accessory to, you know, a shoe store or, you know, a music store. And, you know, staff's response would be that it would still have to go through a public hearing process to establish it the owner would have to show that the use is actually, you know, is accessory to that principal use. It can't be that after hours that somehow they have a food establishment and they're actually operating a second principal use. That, that would actually be a second principal use in a different permitting path. It wouldn't be accessory. So um, at the same time to have outdoor dining, you need a kitchen. So it's a pretty big investment, you know, so typically to have food service, you need to have a board of health approval and go through their approval process and you need 
um, a pretty large investment of capital funds to have a, a place that could have food. You know, even if you allowed a food truck onto your property, um, you know, that still needs other permitting. And so, you know, staff doesn't think that people will clamor to have outdoor dining now just because we've made this accessory. Um, we also think that there are some opportunities that we don't know about uh, that maybe this would actually be a good thing. Maybe it would be okay if, if, a, if a shop downtown or in a village center said, I'd actually like to have outdoor dining. Um, and they're not necessarily related to food and drink. And so, um, you know, in the, the same concern, I'll just scroll down is for live and pre-recorded music. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're moving a restaurant bar or in, we're leaving in bed and breakfast, but now we're also saying to any principal use in section 3.3, again, it would follow the same special permit or site plan review. And there are conditions for live or pre-recorded music already in the bylaw. So it says clearly accessory and incidental to a principal use. So it can't just be, you know, I'm going to have music just because I want loud music. It has to be clearly accessory and incidental. Uh, we have a decibel level limit and we have, um, you know, some other conditions that the planning board could, um, could put on there. So, you know, th there is, you know, that, so to Pam's point, that's, you know, the concern is that we're removing what's in red here and, you know, proposing any principal use in section three. So I, I actually just noticed something only um, just now on this one that might need changed. Um, you've deleted restaurant bar in in 5.042, but not or bed and breakfast. Was that right. just a mistake? Um, no. Accessory use to any principal use in section 3.3. .3. Is bed and breakfast not in 3.3 .3 then? Uh, no, it's considered an accessory use. Oh, yeah, bed and breakfast is an accessory use. Okay. Okay. Because the question I had in going through this um, was a hotel or a motel that serves, you know, a lot, many, if we got, I don't know whether we have one, but say we've got one that does that, um, you know, or wanted one that did that for breakfast, you know, or served, you know, hot drinks at, you know, whatever, and wanted a fire pit outside with dining out there where patrons could do that. I just don't know how that works. Like could, um, unless we do this change, could say a hotel that does that morning breakfast put tables outside for their patrons to eat their breakfast that they are served at the hotel, like that includes breakfast and all um, now? Or would they, or would they be prohibited unless we make this change from having sort of any outdoor seating at all um, for you know next to the dining part? Um, yeah, so I think you know there's a difference um, between an establishment having um, food available for as part of their normal operations for say their guests or patrons than having it to the general public for sale, you know, for like retail sale, and so. Um, you know, in your example, you know, I know oftentimes a hotel motel may have, you know, continental breakfast. And so I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I'm trying to think if, you know, for instance, it could be different where maybe, um, right, maybe if there's a boarding house, which doesn't, and then all of a sudden they want to have, you know, outdoor dining. Um, but it really, unless if it's for their patrons, um, you know, what we're saying here, Sorry, I'm just gonna keep scrolling up. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I not, you know, I could ask Chris and Rob what they would think, but I think if it's for the the people who are using it traditionally, then I'm not sure it's an accessory use unless it becomes, um, you know, completely different what they're offering. So you know, like I, so maybe in the boarding house one that is an accessory use, but for a hotel or motel, I guess it depends on kind of the extent of what they're doing in terms of food service. You know, I mean, there's probably, I don't know, Rob might be able to answer, but I feel like if it's just a continental breakfast, that's different. If it's going to like a full kitchen, they're doing something more, you know, like a bigger, bigger service than maybe, maybe becomes accessory. Rob? So with the proposed language, uh, as Nate has it up on the screen, the, the principal use would be the hotel, which is not a food or drink establishment. And this language being available to any principal use would allow 
the example that Mandy just uh, described to happen under an accessory use permit, uh, which would be authorized by whatever the permitting requirement is for the hotel. If we were to insert the language that Pam suggested that limits the accessory use being available to only principal uses that are food or drink establishments, then it wouldn't be available through. I actually didn't say that. I said it, though it would be any establishment that sells food or drink. So it could be a hotel. That's gonna be confusing interpret to interpret. <laughs> So okay. we're either going we're either going to say that every establishment that decides to serve food or drink, even at, even if it's not part of their principal use, would qualify, or we're going to have to take the more strict interpretation and say it's intended that your principal use has to have a food or drink component to it. So I, I don't like that language because it's, it's hard to interpret. Um, but finishing, you know, finishing my thought that if we, um, if we don't allow that uh, to be clearly an accessory use opportunity for the, that principal use, there's another path. It's more complicated. It's establishing two principal uses. So we would have to fully permit the hotel and fully permit some sort of food and drink establishment so that they can serve that, that food and have the outdoor dining as accessory to that second use. So it just complicates things, but it still would be a possibility through the way our bylaws structured. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm. Yeah, I keep trying to think of like an example in my mind. So let's say at the general store, um, you know, at North Square, if they sell candy, if they put some chairs outside, but you could, you know, take your snack and eat it. Would that, you know, would that be what we kind of have in mind here? It's not. Or, or because they sell candy, <clears throat> is it not considered a different use? Rob? That, that is not what we're talking about here. So, you know, the way I've interpreted this over the years is there's a difference between outdoor dining and outdoor seating. Okay. You know, there could be outdoor seating for anything, including town hall, you know, for us to go out and eat our lunch. It, it really doesn't matter what the use is. Uh, if there's a food service, food sales component where it's prepared on site, um, we always try to connect it to some sort of a food license that we grant through the health department. Uh, that's when we start looking at it as outdoor dining, where there's, um, you know, wait staff or some, some service component to the food being uh, uh, either delivered and consumed outside in a formal dining area, in a, di a defined dining area. So the general oh, yeah. so, so I quickly thinks so I just want to say yeah so I guess Manny when you asked your question I was thinking that you know sometimes when I go to a bed and breakfast or a hotel they just have like a basket of muffins and some bagels and then you can either eat outside or you take it to your room and to me that wouldn't be an accessory use but if they then have a kitchen right where they're serving more food right Rob so I mean I feel like if a bed and breakfast just has in their lobby you know donuts and bagels every morning to me that's not an accessory outdoor dining Right, and is that just? I, I, I agree. Yeah, you know, but if it all of a sudden they start, you know, they have a few chairs outside on a patio, but if they right start having preparing more food with a kitchen and having service, then that becomes the seasonal accessory use or outdoor, you know, whatever it is. Okay, Shalini. I would be. Uh interested in hearing what are Pam's concerns if this like what could go wrong with this because in my mind I'm imagining that we want to make it easier for more people to have outdoor dining everyone has loved that so much and and even if it's like a bookstore and wants to have you know outdoor tea and coffee or something to sit or like general store as Jennifer said not just candy but maybe they have a little cafe now out serving coffee and coffee yeah, or something like that, that we want to make it, we don't want to create roadblocks for that, but we want to make it easier for people. So, yeah. Pam, do you wish to respond? Sure. Um, I think more so than, more so than the outdoor dining is probably the outdoor music. That's a lot harder to manage, really, really hard to manage because we've all talked about sort of noise 
noise migration and, and noise pollution um, based on you know out, outdoor activities. Um, I guess I have a harder time with with outdoor entertainment being an accessory used to some primary function um, because it really is very different than pri any primary function of you know even even food service or bars or something. I mean, it's a lovely thing to have music, um, but it's it's kind of a weird connection to make um, with any of the of the uses. So I think. Um, I could probably live with it. I could probably live with it um, as it as it's shown with any principal use. It just seemed so broad that um, you know it's like you you really don't know what you're going to end up in your backyard. Um, and part part of that is because I'm a NIMBY, I have a whole limited business district, you know, within forty feet of my back corner of my property. I'm I'm thinking, you know, in 20 years when I'm tottering around, am I going to have, you know, nightclub people pouring out into my backyard practically? So it's it's sort of trying to look ahead, but I'm I'm willing to accept the proposed language. Um, just recognize that I have I had I do have concerns. Anything else, Shalini? Um, I. I guess, uh, do we have existing things in place to make sure that um, those concerns are addressed? And that might be for Rob and Nate. Like, what can we have? What do we already have in place? Or that would address what Pam just spoke about? Yeah, well, I think what's here in terms of the live or pre recorded entertainment, it's not necessarily outside. It's just, that is accessory. So we're not, you know, we're up above, we're saying outdoor dining or, you know, it could be outdoor dining, but here it's just a live or pre-recorded entertainment. It could be inside or outside. I think what we have here, what's nice is that we say um, a special permit will be required whenever an accessory entertainment is proposed uh, and any outside wall of that portion of the building by the principal use is located within 150 feet or less from a residential uh, uh, dwelling in a residential district. And so it's the si similar language that was in the BN standards and condition, but for music, you know, it's, um, you know, there is that safeguard. So if, if an establishment on Triangle Street uh, would like to now have music as an accessory use, and it's 150 feet or less within 150 feet of a residential use in, in, in the adjoining district, it, it always needs a special permit. So these accessory uses aren't administratively approved. They're either site plan review or special permit. So there's always a public hearing process with the neighbors being notified. And so, you know, I think that um, that's one. And then we also have, you know, just these sub conditions that it has to be clearly accessory and incidental to the principal use, um, that there's a, a sound level. Um, and then, um, you know, we have right here, which has been used that the permit granting board may impose a probationary period and that the applicant would return um, at a public meeting or to have things be reviewed again. And so, you know, I, I think that those are, you know, by having this in the bylaw, it, it, it allows conditions through the permitting to, to have some safeguards. And so, you know, clearly accessory and incidental too, right? So to the example, is someone just gonna, any business, it's also, you know, only in these few districts that it's allowed, but those are the downtown and village center districts. Um, you know, someone couldn't just come in now and say, oh, I'd like to do this just because, you know, we'd walk through and ask how it is clearly accessory and incidental to, you know, is it the same hours of operation? How is it benefiting the principal use? How is it, you know, related to it? So, um, I mean, I, I feel like those are, you know, that's what staff would, would use. That sounds like a lot of things in place with respect to the sound and the distance and all of that. So I'm hoping, Pam, that those address. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to condition 10 on section in the use table. Um, and given the questions asked and the comments had, um, I, you know, I, 
I'm not going to make a motion now, but I'd like to hear whether the committee would support and potentially whether the planning staff would support, because maybe we can do it without a motion, um, that we up the seat total to 45 or 50. Um, you know, not necessarily the occupancy. We, we have a disconnect between what total occupancy is and what seat total is. But I guess I'm thinking a Coronation Cafe size or a Momo's Cafe size doesn't seem too big for our BN area, yet they are too big under condition 10. Um, and then the 100 feet thing, I'm still worried about. So I actually liked, Nate, your idea of a potential waiver, but I'm not sure any of the language in here allows a waiver. And so I wonder if we could potentially change the 30 seats to 50 seats um, and add some sort of language that might allow um, the permit granting authority to waive the 100 foot distance requirement down to, you know, just wave it, you know, I, I don't know what the language would be. Um, but those are some of the, th that's a proposal I have, and I'd like to hear from the committee what they think and also what planning staff would think about those two changes. Jennifer. Yeah, just off the top of my head, I could support the first, you know, increasing the size to like a coronation cafe. I'm just not sure about the hundred feet because I feel like that's in terms of, even as Nate said, that's nothing in terms of sound traveling. So I'm trying to think, so let's say it's where Hope and Feathers is. If that were to become like a food establishment and could have 50 people sitting inside, I would think that would be all right. Um, and if they, but in the back, it really, does a butt up against a residential neighborhood. So I would think you would want at least 50, 100 feet there in terms of outdoor dining um, for the re surrounding residential neighborhood. But I'd be interested in what Nate has to say about that. Yeah, Nate, could you put up that map again that showed us the 150 things and for those plots? Yeah, I was trying to get to the online GIS and it's not loading right now. No, um, nothing. So I do think that, you know, so um, Jennifer, what you just mentioned that building is, you know, within like 70 feet of a residential use in the residential districts next to it, you know, south and west. So that building, essentially that property probably could never be um, developed as, um, you know, any of those uses. And so, you know, I think what we found was that the VFW site and maybe the one property on the corner of High Street are the two that are actually have some space that's a hundred feet away. But almost every other property in the BN with this uh, buffer cannot be uh, developed uh, as as a uh, restaurant or food and drink establishment because with outside in terms of outside space you could do it inside. No, the way that condition oh. works is that so if the wall of the building that has the restaurant in it is within a hundred feet of oh. a residential use in a residential district, so. It can't you know, even be inside. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't get can't that. Can't be inside. Okay. So yeah, sorry that yeah the, the website's not loading. Um, uh, yeah. I might maybe I'll just use Google Maps in a minute then. If, but yeah, so really there is about two properties in all the BN then that could be developed with that condition in place. Pam, yeah, I was gonna um, echo what Jennifer said that um, something the size of Coronation seems like it would it would be appropriate in some of the buildings that we know are already there. Um, I think maybe maybe how we could manage it a little better given the, the really close proximity to residences is that is that there's some stipulation that there that there isn't outdoor dining allowed or outdoor music in the BN. I mean it's just it it would be um, kind of over the top. So you could have you could have a great indoor space, but you just wouldn't um, you wouldn't be allowing it to spill out to the outdoors and carry that noise with it. So is that sort of instead of saying I'm trying to read this condition. Um, I can't read um, it. It's so tiny. And it right oh. now it says any outside wall of a building occupied by they moved it by an establishment shall be located more than a hundred feet from the resident from any residential dwelling. And so oh. instead of the any outside building outside of a building, you could say any outdoor 
accessory use or something would have to be located more than 100 feet from the dwelling, or maybe just say, get rid of that sentence at all completely and say, the BN shall have no outdoor I thing. See that. Um, Pam, is that sort of where you're going? One of those? Kind of where I was headed, yeah. I mean, and yeah. I, and I and I understand that somebody might want, you know, the three tables outside their front door on a summer night. Um, is that does that become accessory outdoor dining? That's a question for Rob and Nate. Rob or Nate on that one. Um, sorry, so you're saying like if there's a rat, like a, a say like a deli or something like a cafe and they put outdoor seating, the way this works is that it's not whether or not it's accessory. If you don't allow it at all, then there's no outdoor seats at all. So it doesn't matter if it's accessory or whatever. It's just, it wouldn't be allowed. And so, you know, I, I you know, my thought would be um, if you're really worried about late night noise, maybe you have an end time in the BN district and you just eliminate that whole 100 foot buffer at all. And you just say establishments would close at a certain time, I guess. I mean, I think it's hard, right? We're trying to have some balance and flexibility to encourage businesses. And then you don't want to then um, have a condition or two that's so restrictive. No one, no one wants to, right. wants to, you know, even try it. Right. Because um, so I think, like I said, I think right now with the 30 seats and the 100 foot buffer, it, it actually, I don't think many, I don't think there would be a restaurant at all really <laughs> would, would come in just, I don't, like I guess I don't think there's many properties that could support it. Um, and, you know, I, so. Yeah, I was just wondering if it's the music, that's the real problem. We could just say no music outdoors, but you could have people seating outside. Yeah, I, I want to go back to Jennifer, because um, you were concerned with this buffer. And so I, with, you know, we'll take the hope and feathers. It, I, I, I keep asking this because I feel like that's a prime property that could potentially like that building, if there is an opening, could house a cafe, yet this condition does not allow it to house a cafe. And so like Jennifer, do you think that building should be able to house a cafe? And if so, like what conditions would you? Yeah, I mean, I don't that? see actually if 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 the lumber yard could be like half a block away. I don't know. I I would like. I do think Hope and Feathers. I think it would make a lovely cafe. <laughs> um, and that's why I was thinking. But maybe it shouldn't have music, which it wouldn't have to. And if you had some tables in the front, because the resident abuts the residences in the back. So I would think that if you went with your suggestion, Mandy, where you could have up to 50, because it, the interior could certainly hold that. I, and I love hope and feathers. I'm not hoping it goes away, but if they wanted, yeah, I, again, my concern was just in the back, that maybe you could have some in the front and the front, because I didn't realize when I said that, that the hundred feet has to do with even indoors. Yeah. So are you Rob, saying bacon feathers couldn't be a cafe because the indoors abuts the residential? In the, back? the building is within a hundred feet of the residential. So no nowhere in that building could have a cafe. Rob, do you have any suggestions? You had your hand up. Yeah, well, because I would I just wanted to clarify it. that that building would no longer allow this use because of that distance. So there, there, there used to be a cafe in there. It was called Wheatberry. Uh, okay. It was, it was right. permitted 15 or so years ago, and the district was different. It wasn't BN at the time. So over the years, uh, and when I came to work here, uh, there were a couple modifications of the establishment, including some outdoor dining right out in the front parking lot there, on the corner. And that was done, you know, through a permit process with the planning board, and it was considered a pre-existing non-conforming use. So since that ended and has been abandoned for, for a couple of years or more, that, that is no longer available at that spot. So uh, that one, this 100-foot provision would prohibit it from happening there now. Could it be 
changed from any outside wall of a building occupied shall be located more to any outside use, you know, outside accessory use or something shall be located more than 100 feet from any residential dwelling. Is that some, is that a logical like change from a, a permitting standpoint? I, I don't understand what your question is. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is instead of basing the prohibition on the building distance so that you can't have the indoor use, base the outdoor use and the outdoor concerns um, on that distance. So like if you put, and, and I, I can't look at the building, but Wheatberry, for example, that, that corner outdoor dining that they might have had, outdoor tables, might have actually been 100 feet from any re residential dwelling. But maybe if you put it in the back, like Jennifer said, you're only 50 feet and that's not as reasonable. And so could you base sort of the outdoor use needs to be within over more than 100 feet from the dwelling instead of the building? So if you had outdoor tables in front where the parking area is, would that bother the people living in the back of the building? Right. Like, is that Rob and Nate from a, from a, you know, permitting standpoint, is that sort of something that can be determined and enforced? Yeah, I think it can. I mean, it's, it's um, comparable to our marijuana, marijuana provisions where we're, we're measuring the actual activity, the marijuana use to the distance to the residential uh, property. So it's similar to that. Um, you know, I, I guess I always thought this was more about the door coming out of the establishment where I was trying to catch the outside wall. But in the, you know, in the Wheatberry example, it's the, it's the rear wall of the building that doesn't house this use at all that is in proximity to the residential uses. So even, even a change that the measurement is taken to the actual boundary of the use would be beneficial in that building. Uh, whether it's internal or, or external, uh, any anything would be, uh, you know, would I guess would offer more options because the building is so deep. And it would have a nine o'clock alcohol limit. Yeah. yeah. Nate and then Shalini. Two sure, things. I mean, but Manny, what you're suggesting is saying instead of any outside wall, you could say any outdoor seating shall be located. <laughs> more than 100 feet and so it becomes the outdoor seating that's the 100 feet and whether or not the the use inside the building is closer it's really that outdoor um dining seat outdoor seating and so that, i mean that's the way i would phrase it any and any outdoor seating shall be located more than 100 feet and so we just i mean i, I you know i don't i don't i think that would be a lot more manageable than and allow some things to happen um you know but i so that's my understanding of what you're saying mandy so yeah i mean i don't if that if we think that's sufficient um i think that's better than what it is now thank you shalini you did you have something to say i was going a slightly different direction so i just want to make sure every like can we all agree or whatever we need to do with this because i like your suggestion what you just made and i see all of us are nodding other than pam I was looking at the BN map. I was, yeah, I, I've, I've got my map open to the satellite view and looking at that. Um, so this is, a very, this is a very particular situation where you have, which I think is, I'm looking at the right one, it's at the corner of Dickinson and Maine, and there's a large parking lot to the west of the building, as well as parking uh, on the Main Street side of the building. And it seems that you would certainly not want to have outdoor activity on the west side because it's immediately adjacent to the neighbor, but um, that there could be some perhaps outdoor seating on the main street side of things. And I don't know if I did a little, if I did a little, uh, draw a, drew a measured line, what that, what that would be. Well, from the residence to the building itself is 124 feet. So you, oh, there, there's the map. Good. Yeah. Nate's so much quicker than I am. Is 
quickly, yeah, there's also the house to the south. And so from the house to the south to the front of the building is about a hundred feet. So that, you know, that gives you an idea of what the hundred foot, you know, if we're talking about the way it's written now, I mean, right. So then this whole property can't even be used for a restaurant. If we, you know, BN is up here as well, where Miss Media is, say, for instance, they, um, you know, were not, you know, they were um, going to change, you know, 100 feet. I think we did this last time is, you know, to about here. So, you know, basically anywhere in this area, you know, you know, no building could be developed that could touch this radius, right? That 100 feet. And so um, the BN is, you know, this is being redeveloped. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine that with, um, you know, we could do 100 feet that maybe somehow they would want to put um, a use in maybe in this building, right? They're redeveloping it with apartments. Um, you know, it's been permitted with the new building. So in the BN, oh. you know, so, yeah, I mean, with that 100 foot, there's really limited uh, opportunity. But, yeah, sorry. So I'll, I'll go back to this example. So, so but it looks like the 100 feet wouldn't, because you're still 100 feet from the house in, to the south and the house to the west. If you did, went to the use itself, right, to the outdoor seating. Right. But if you were, you know, the way it's written now, the building has to be a hundred feet, which you know is basically to the front of this. Yeah. So the right now the building itself is within that hundred feet, so you can't put uh, Any, under the current proposed change. You can't put a cafe in it. You'd have to put the cafe in the parking lot. Right. You have to build it right. The other so you're not talking about putting like let's go back to Amherst Media Building. You're not talking about moving the building. Well, so for instance, the way the bylaw is written now, that condition is said that the outside wall of a building that houses the use, right, a restaurant or cafe can't be within 100 feet of a residential use in a residential district. So what that means is within 100 feet, a, bu a, a building wall can't even be within that distance. You can't touch it. So here's, you know, here's 100 feet, right? So 100 feet from this residential use you know, basically to the street here. I mean, there's no, you know, unless you're going to put a building, a small little building right here, there's no building that can even be built that could house a restaurant on these properties. Yeah. Although I don't know, this is where things get, I don't want to digress. I think those two sides of the street are very different. I don't think you'd want to, that is such a historic spot by the Emily Dickinson Museum and those mansions. I don't think you want a restaurant on that north side of the street i think the south side is a very different place right i mean this is also the local historic district so any any changes right. to the to the building would have to have local historic district approval so the character would you know would be compatible chris so i just wanted to note that the um, local historic district commission did approve the building that was designed to house Emerson Media, but what if they built the building and Emerson Media went out of business for whatever reason, technology changed or whatever, and then people were looking for a new use for that building, and it could be that that building could be used as a restaurant. It wouldn't have much parking associated with it, but we'd figure that out in the future, but it could be that that building needs to be re reused as something else, so I'm just putting that out there. To think about the future. And the current proposal would not allow that reuse as a restaurant. That's correct. So, you know, I don't know whether we're ready to propose any language or where we are um, in terms of making a recommendation. Um, do we want, to, as a committee, do we want to make a recommendation? Do we want to make a recommendation that includes potential changes to condition 10. It sounds like that's the only one where we are sort of struggling with potential language that we would want to see and potentially recommend to the council different. Um, where does the committee want to go? Pam. My gut feeling is that I think I think it's on the right track, but I, I really don't like designing by committee. And that um, I think the planning staff has has heard this conversation, and that for now we just leave it as it is. The BN 
statutes are still in play. They've been in place all this time. So we're not really touching them. Um, I'd like to I'd like to actually have them just recognize we that we're putting this on the table just for a short while and I hope the, the planning staff might come back to this. I like the idea of perhaps changing it from you know 30 seats to 50 seats for the time being. Um, but I'm really I'm really not clear on all the ramifications for the hundred foot setbacks. And so it's it just feels a little rushed to be trying to do that right now. Um, Shalini? I was just curious what if there what are the ramifications in South Amherst? Like in the are there any such spaces in South Amherst near the Pomeroy village or where this would be relevant, this conversation? Or is the it DN is only around that area we were looking at. So it you know only okay. encompasses you know that the 319, 321 Main Street and then some mm -hmm. properties to the north and then one or two to the south. So it's, you know, it doesn't, it's nowhere else in town. Mm. I mean, I'm, yeah, I would love to hear, I'd love to hear Chris, what she has to say first. Chris? Well, I was just going to talk about timing and article 14 is expiring at the end of December. So if this proposal doesn't get approved, we're back to the way we've always, um, you know, regulated things. So I'm just putting that out there that this proposal isn't going to be around and article, what is it, 5, 11, and 12 aren't going to be around. So I would encourage, um, you know, even though, even if you don't think this number 10 is perfect, I would encourage you to vote to recommend the whole package and then maybe come back to this Article 10 at a different time. I don't really think people are going to be clamoring to open restaurants in the BN district anytime in the near future. And to have this whole package be adopted, I think, is important and a good thing. So I just want to encourage you to try to move forward and not um, postpone a decision about this whole uh, proposal. That's all. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Um, I, I understand that. And we could make a motion to recommend the council adopt the revisions with additional changes. I, I'm trying to draft a motion in my head that would say with additional changes to condition 10 um, to increase the BN seating limit to 50 seats, say. And then we're dealing with this one. Would the planning staff have time between now and the first reading on the 5th to come up with changes that align with what we've just discussed about um, the 100 foot limit? So, I mean, I think I would, um, you know, changes the way I, I said so that the it's instead of saying in any outside wall of a building occupied by the establishment. So, um, you know, this area, I would say in any outdoor seating shall be located more than 100 feet. And so it would be, you know, I, to me, that would be uh, the change, you know, I'd keep, you know, we'd say both indoor and outdoor 30 seats. And so we'd kind of use the same uh, terminology, right? So any outdoor seating shall be located more than 100 feet. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, unless there's more, I would rather, you know, I, and it seems like that's what we have been discussing. I wouldn't, unless there's a, I'd rather have then a specific recommendation or more guidance from the committee as to what you'd want to see changed. Um, you know, I, I feel like those are the things we've been talking about, the distance to this outdoor seating and the number of seats. I don't know how, how much more I'd want to change, you know, the standard of condition. Thank you, Nate. Jennifer, then Pat, then Shalini. Chris, yeah. sorry, Chris has a hand up too. Oh, Chris, sorry, Jennifer. Chris first. Okay. I only had three hands on my screen at that point. So I was wondering what you wanted to do with outdoor um, music or any kind of music in the BN. That was a proposal that someone had made early on. Do you want to just eliminate the possibility of having live or pre recorded music in the BN? Jennifer. Yeah, so this is where I guess I'm, a little, you know, deaf feeling 
carrying on what um, Pam said, again, to me, there is a big difference between the BN by the Emily Dickinson Museum and where Hope and Feathers is. So I would be reluctant to do a sweeping change that, because I think if where the building, the local historic district commission approved a building, but I think if you, it, it shouldn't just be allowed to be maybe a pizza restaurant with pizza boxes outside, you know, in that very, his, the most historic square, so to speak, in town. So I would be uncomfortable making a change that, because I think those two sides of the street are so different that we would really need to have a very considered conversation about that. I don't know if that's possible if they're both zoned the same. I mean, I personally think it's problematic that the north side of the street is zone BN. It's much more appropriate for the south side of the street where Hope and Feathers is. So I would be reluctant to, to do anything hasty that would affect by the Hills mansions, the Hills houses and the Emily Dickinson Museum and the um, Women's Club. I, I think that has to be a very considered changes there it is very different than the south side of the street. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, um, the historical district protects that area. And I really can't imagine the historical Not district. Not from usage. But what right. it would look like. And and fantasizing pizza packages, I think, I think I really support what Chris is saying is let's move forward with this and then make any changes afterwards. Uh, I think that there's a lot of, um, I think that there's panicking about things that most likely would not happen. I'm so, you know, I just, I think that, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking about the uh, women's, the um, women's uh, building and, the, you know, and it, it just, I think we're overreacting and that we just need to move forward with this. Uh, I totally agree with Chris on, and, uh, and we can come back, but to keep going and making minor changes because pizza boxes feels to me like potential pizza boxes. No, no, but Chris's me. change is not let, to change. Let Pat finish, Jennifer. I just That's okay, I'm done, I'm done. Um, Shalini and then Jennifer. And uh, I was just going to say that, you know, we still have the staff looking. It's not like once we make this change, everything is going to be allowed. I mean, we know that our staff really, really knows the town and what residents. And so I'm sure there'll be discernment there that we won't have any pizza boxes outside in that property <laughs> versus, sorry to pick on that example, but you know, I think there's going to be that discernment that the town staff has. And I, I think what I'm really visioning is more like where Wheatberry was and the cherry scones were, and there was that lovely space outside to sit and have your coffee and meet people and be by the community and then walk down to the museum or library. And also, I think these are little pockets we want to create where people can be outdoors. And uh, so, I, I would really like to see this um, move forward. And can I, I mean, I don't want to go back to the 30, like maybe that's what they were envisioning. That's why they had 30 to begin with is so that there are these little pockets everywhere. But then just keeping in mind that maybe for businesses, it's not worth the investment if there are only 30 occupants or, or patrons allowed. So I think that's why expanding it to 50, I support that. And if we can keep it to 100 feet to the um, to the outdoor, I think that seems like it'll take care of a lot of the concerns here. And also the outdoor, did we answer that one that should, can we just not have music? Would that just take care of it? Or is that a big concern in this committee in the BN district? It would be a concern. You can, was somebody going to answer Shalini's question? Ms. Georgia? 
So um, the the outdoor music would require either a special permit or an access a site plan review based on the language we're aiming to change. And so that that would require a special approval anyway, even if it was planned, right? Um, under the changes to section five accessory uses as explained earlier in today's meeting. Right, that was explained, my bad. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, no, I just was wondering if Chris, what you were suggesting we go ahead with included changing that 100 feet or as it was recommended without that? Chris? I, I was suggesting to recommend to change uh, it as Nate had suggested, which was um, 100 feet to any outdoor use. And the 50? And the 50 um, seats, yes. So I, I'm gonna try something, but I, I will also mention that currently in the BN, there is no prohibition on live music or recorded music or entertainment right now. Um, so that, as long as it's for a cafe, if the cafes were there, um, so that wouldn't be changing um, either. So I'm gonna try a motion to recommend the council adopt the revisions to food and drink establishments, article three use regulations, article five accessory uses, article 11, administration and enforcement and article 12 de definitions as presented on November 17, 2022, um, with additional changes to condition 10 in the use table to increase the BN seating limit to 50 seats and to change the 100 foot limit to apply only to outdoor seating. Is there a second to that motion? Second, DeAngelis. And Athena, I have it written down so I can send it to you if you didn't quite get it. Thanks, um, I almost got every word. <laughs> You're amazing. <laughs> Conversation on this motion. Could you repeat it once more? Sure. Um, this is a motion. So I didn't. It's the last part, just that 50. Uh, you know, so, so it was with additional changes because this is, that's what would then happen. Um, so with additional changes to condition 10 in the use table to increase the BN seating limit to 50 seats and to change the 100 foot limit to apply only to outdoor seating. So that, and, and I did that so that it allows um, the planning department to come up with the best language to, you know, 30 goes to 50, right? Um, but for the other one to come up with the best language based on that discussion. Nate, I think's come up with good ones, but I didn't wanna have to concentrate on getting the exact amendment right here. <laughs> Jennifer? So is it possible to vote on the 50 and then at the next meeting, Nate comes back with language about the 100 feet? <laughs> I, that may not make sense, but. Um, so our next Nate's meeting. Still here? Oh yeah, you are, okay. Nate is still here. Um, our next meeting is, um, where's right. my calendar? December. The first, which is before the first reading. So we could um, ask for that language specifically. Um, what though I would hope though is because GOL would review this on the 30th, which is before our next meeting, I want to be able to say we've made a recommendation so we can get something to GOL, even if we then come back on the first and review specific language. I could add that potentially to the motion with further review, you know, with future review of the language or something. Because um, we're really aiming to get this to the council for a first review on the fifth because of what Chris said. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure I need to add it to the motion, but we could have this. And what I would say is make this motion that allows me to send it to GOL as we're done with it, sort of, um, um, and let GOL know that there is additional changes to that one line coming that will 
have a draft by then, um, and then we could review it ourselves on the first and revote that particular language recommendation on the first, all of which would still allow us to hit um, the first reading on the fifth. Does that sort of make sense, Jennifer? Um, so I'm going to ask Pam because I, you really understand all these drawings and plans and where the you can visualize okay. as a so planner. We'll go to Shalini while Pam thinks. Right, I'm not. And, yeah. <laughs> and I was going to ask a question to clarify a little more, Jennifer and Pam, like what we might be asking of need. Like, is it a substantive change? we're talking about like do we want to change the number 100 or are we talking about need coming up with alternatives to that or are we talking about just refining the language to make it so in which case it's not going to be a, a substantive change but were you thinking of a more um yeah what sort of like what were we hoping need to come back with I think Jennifer should answer that, but I was gonna. I was okay, gonna... no, I was just wondering because you we had just asked Nate to come back with something. I didn't ask him; somebody else did. Who? So, so <laughs> Nate has suggested language. Me trying to figure out how to make a motion with that was difficult. So, um, so yeah, I was, was just saying if Nate is coming back with language or is going to develop language, it would, maybe we should, you know, hear it first. That's just what I was saying. I don't know who said. Nate was going to come back with language. So I think Nate's proposed language, and I just didn't want to take the time to figure out how to put it into a motion, was to remove the phrase, any outside wall of a building occupied by the establishment shall be located more than, and insert the phrase, um, I don't know, something like, where's my notes? any outdoor seating shall be more than shall be located more than so change what he highlighted to any outdoor seating mm -hmm. i just thought that got complicated in a motion and it was easier to just say those were the changes pam um i, I think i'm just looking at the other parts of the bn and I would I would like to hold to the hundred feet, but I but I can live with the um, you know hundred feet from outdoor seating areas to any any nearby residential, and I'm okay with changing it to a total of fifty seats um, and no alcohol after nine. I would I would be more comfortable simply saying no music, um, but I guess that's a case by case situation. Um, where if it is a site site plan or special permit that there could be concerns raised at that time. So I, I believe I'm okay with uh, changing it as suggested. I, I really don't like doing zoning this way. This is not a good way to do it. <laughs> Rob. I just would like to suggest that you keep uh, the motion with the changes that you want, but not specifically where you want them. I'd like time to talk with Nate because, um, you know, from my point of view, I'd rather see the distance to outdoor dining and the the prohibited live entertainment or music to be in Article Five, so that we're regulating all of that in the same place instead of breaking it up. And, and it'll be harder for the user, you know, not me necessarily, but somebody else looking at adding outdoor dining to their establishment to find it here than over in Article 5 where all the outdoor dining regulation is. So I, I was okay with it when it was a, just talking about a total number of seats, um, but when we're getting specific about outdoor dining and, and entertainment, I might suggest that we at least consider that it be over in, in Article 5 before deciding on it. So I think the motion might be flexible enough right now to help you do that before the 5th of December. Um, I think it, I think it was. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if, if that's the feeling and, and what I would request is that it be done before the 29th or 28th. Um, I know Thanksgiving is next week. 
because like I said, GOL will will meet on the 30th and they're gonna need sort of the sort of proposed language. I would bring that language back on the first for CRC to see so that I could add an addendum to our report about the specific language. Um, you know, and and we could then vote on that language wherever it end up. Um, any other comments, questions? Pam. Could you just read your, uh, and I want to say thanks to Rob for that. That's exactly what was making me kind of nervous is we don't really know what we're tweaking and you need time to look at it. Um, could you just read your motion again, please? Sure. It's to recommend the council adopt the revisions to food and drink establishments, Article 3, use regulations, Article 5, accessory uses, Article 11, administration and enforcement, and Article 12, definitions, as presented on November 17, 2022, with additional changes to Condition 10 in the use table to increase the BN seating limit to 50 seats and to change the 100-foot limit to apply only to outdoor seating. And so I think that's flexible enough for at least the change to the 100 foot limit to be potentially removed from condition 10 and moved over to accessory uses article five. Rob, is that true? Yeah, I thought I, I'm comfortable with that. I thought it was. Uh, did, did you want to add and to prohibit outdoor music? Committee? Yeah, I think I think that would make sense in this zone. Yeah, because it's so close to. Is, is it outdoor music or outdoor entertainment? And uh, I don't have the thing up. Yeah, I, I think I've it's out, out, outdoor live or pre-recorded entertainment. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so um, so I would add to the end of that motion after the word seating. And to prohibit outdoor live or pre recorded entertainment. Um, Pat, I believe you seconded the motion. Would that be a friendly amendment? That's fine. Okay. With that, are we ready to make a motion uh, ready to vote? It looks like we are. Um, I think I start with Pat. Aye. Um, that means me, I'm an I, Pam. I. Jennifer. I. And Shalini. Yes. That is a unanimous vote. I am making a note to bring for, for CRC to review the language on the first. Um, but I will, and all of that. Um, given the time, I, sorry, John, it's taken me so long. I don't think we're going to get to anything rental registration today. Um, so sorry, I, I didn't tell you that sooner. Um, looking at our agenda, our next thing is associate member vacancies on the ZBA. In the packet was the list of, um, of current applicants prior to the SOI. Um, Shalini. So we can, I mean, so can the staff leave then? Oh, yes. So yes, thank you for making me finish that. We are done with Chris, Nate, Rob, and John because we will not get to rental registration given the timing today. So thank you, all of you. Thank you, John, for popping back in. Um, I was a little off in how long it would take us, but thank you all. Um, I'll be in touch regarding the meeting in two weeks. So. Um, with that, yes, associate member vacancies on the ZBA. Um, Pam, would you like to explain where we stand right now? Sure. We have um, five people that have responded saying they are still interested in being considered. None of them has been asked for a statement of interest yet. That's going to be done in one, one group. Um, we have three ZBA associate member openings. And I wondered if it would be worth considering or discussing the length of term since it is going to be literally half a year late in getting folks on uh, as associate members that they would literally only have between, let's just say January and the end of June to serve their term if we 
if we, as part of this process, asked if they would be interested in serving a year and a half, which is a term and a half. So um, I'll respond to that one, which is the charge itself limits the ZBA associate member terms to one year. So we can only appoint for one year at most. And right now we are actually appointing for vacancies. Um, and so the vacancies can only be appointed to the end of the vacancy. What we could potentially think about is asking the council to um, appoint ZBA, uh, uh, essentially make two appointments. Um, appoint to fill the vacancies as they are now through the end of the term, June 30, 2023, and also appoint simultaneously to fill three of the vacancies for the next term. There's a potential downside to that though. And I will say that means a lot of times some of our ZBA associates become ZBA full members. If they've already been appointed to a term for the next year as an associate member, if they, if, if they were to want to sort of apply to upgrade to a full member and this committee made that recommendation to do so and made a recommendation and the council did so, we would end up with then a vacancy in the associate members that we might not, we might be in the same situation here versus if they're all expiring, we get to look at that set of appointments in May and June holistically more. Um, it, it just becomes cleaner at that point. That, but that's the only thing I would say about that. Just think about that because we have at least one opening um, coming up. I, I'd have to look to see whether it's one or two coming up for full members. And who knows whether there will be people seeking reappointment, but we have to do the interviews for that. Um, and so it all, it, it's, it's a puzzle come June, depending on what you're looking for. And if they're technically already appointed, they'd have to resign their associate. Yeah, it just gets more complicated, I would say. Um, if, so, we, if that is, that is, if we, if we appointed them for longer than, than a half a year. Yeah, if we did both sort of things simultaneously, yeah. Thoughts on, um, right now, all we're considering is sufficiency of the applicant pool. Um, and whether it is sufficient or not to continue on to the SOI process or the interview process at this time. Um, this is all part of the council policy on making recommendations. So we have to make a determination on su sufficiency and find it sufficient before we can actually request SOIs. Um, and so thoughts on these next steps from any CRC members. Yeah, I think we should keep it clean um, so that their term ends June 30th. Um, and we'd have a sense then of any if any of them wanted to stay as an associate member or whether they wanted to move um, into uh, full membership. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, did I miss something in the packet? So we haven't yet, we don't know who's applied. In terms of knowing whether it's sufficient, we just know that there's a certain number. So Maybe you don't received know. all of the SOIs. Um, and so. Um, okay, let me. The CAFs, right? Yes, yeah, sorry, the CAFs, not the SOIs. Um, and in SharePoint, there's a consolidated list with the yeah. green highlights. I think. Yeah, if you go to if you go to our CR, CRC SharePoint site, there is something it's called. It's not in the okay. public packet. It it's can't be because the can't be because right. Okay, so I, I need to look at SharePoint. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Which I, I can run through some demographics. Oh, Pam can probably run through the demographics. You probably have it up. They are all white males. So I want well, to. Know. Some, some a little younger than others. Very diverse pool. 
Yeah. <laughs> white males. Yeah. I think the age range is, is the ranges they gave was somewhere between the 18 to 29 range and also the 70 plus range, I think is the current age range. So, so there is a wide age range. Yeah. Uh, which brings up a good point, And that is that a number of folks in the community have at least asked that, um, that we, we don't share cast because that's, you know, personnel, personnel uh, papers, but that that we are at least able to list who has applied, who's put in and has expressed interest in all of these positions because it, we're trying to lift the, the veil of secrecy um, to sort of at least, at least, and I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's completely my fault. Um, GOL just talked about this, right? <laughs> um, and, and we said, you know, we were using actually the CRC rules as examples of we do disclose those demographics, but I used a, we, we do it always in the report of the applications. I used a different template for this, demo, this, this sort of applicant numbers. And I will make sure I go back and add to that template the demographic information to that one too. Um, so that the next time I pull up the demographic, the, the sufficiency of applicant pool template, it's got a thing to fill in the demographics so that we get that out there publicly when we're just discussing the sufficiency of the applicant pool. So I, I would take full responsibility for, for getting to do that on this one. Um, but we are yeah. really challenged with this committee. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I, I wanna add some of my thoughts um, and, and this is where I struggle. Five for three is, in terms of numbers, probably sufficient. Um, but can we get interviews? I'm just looking at the timing of stuff. If we declare the pool sufficient now, um, either Pam or I will send out interview um, date requests this week. We generally have been seeking to do them at our meetings on Thursdays. Um, but we would probably pull for all Thursdays in December, not just the ones that we have meetings for. And we might even pull for a variety of Monday evenings or something, some other dates that there aren't council meetings, say. Um, we have to, under the rules, under the council policy, have the SOIs do seven days before the meeting because um, they have to be posted seven days before the interview meeting. Um, I can't imagine we can get an interview, given the holidays, I can't imagine we'd want to schedule an interview meeting before the 8th because that would require the SOIs do the first. Um, any earlier, you know, and figuring out if everyone's available and then giving people sufficient time to write a statement of interest over this coming week's holiday might be very problematic. Um, I'm thinking it will take at least a week to get responses back and figure out availability. I, I'm just looking at generosity here and then give them another five, six days to write. So we're looking at the earliest, the eighth for the interviews, which should be an appointment on the 19th. So we'd be looking at, and that's the earliest. Um, if we can't get anything before the 15th, they might not be able to get anything before the new year on terms of interviews. Um, and if that's the case, we're appointing for less than six months. And that's where I struggle. Um, do we go through this to appoint for less than six months and then turn around three months later and start the process all again? Um, and given the struggles we've had with this one, would we even be waiting three months to start the process all again? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, give, given the pool too, right? Um, which despite its numbers might be sufficient, it is in no way diverse. Yeah, and one of our goals is always to have a diverse pool. Um, you can't appoint and create diversity on a committee unless the pool is diverse. So I struggle with saying, do we leave these open yet again for another full year? because of the timing and because of all this, or do we just go ahead and do it anyway, 
And I don't know what the right answer is. Pam. I need to clarify that, that at least one applicant is white and or mixed. So that, that broadens the diversity a little bit. So uh, I have a question and has, I have actually never spoken to Steve Judge to ask him what the responsibilities and how frequently somebody ends up serving. I think there was a meeting not long ago where they in fact didn't have a quorum, but um, I, I honestly don't know how often these associate members have to serve or get to serve. And I I, I really, I, I feel badly because some of them have asked this question. Does anyone know that answer? So my understanding is it varies widely year to year and, you know, committee to a committee. Um, I think in the four years I've done this, we've had years where the associate has never served or a specific associate. This has happened, I think, when we've had a fuller associate membership, but we've had years where an associate has never served. Um, and we've had years where the associate is used heavily. Um, so I, I think that's why we don't really have an answer because I think it depends on the busyness of the ZBA. Um, if they don't have applications and they're not reviewing projects, they don't have meetings, right? Um, if they're reviewing a lot, they might have more use or need for use of associates. Um, and so I think that's why it's hard to answer that well. Jennifer. Is it true that um, if an associate serves, like then they have to follow that application even if at the next meeting the full member's back? Okay. Yes. Yes. So once you've got your panel of five, those five follow that application to the end. It's why last July we actually extended Karen's term as ZBA member through the end of that one application, even though we just appointed her to the planning board. Um, so she was sort of on both at the same time because she has to finish off that application. Um, and we've done that now for the last two or three years that we make sure we specifically extend the serving, whether they be full members or associate members that whoever, if they're not continuing on the board, Part of the motion in the June meeting from the council is to extend to a point for those particular matters, and we name the matters, those members until the, those matters are complete. Other thoughts? The question is, do we move on to solicit SOIs and try and schedule interviews or not is the big, is sort of the big question. Um, well, so, should we ask, should Pam speak with the chair if he's really needing at least, you know. If he feels the urgency. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to reach out to him. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, at Pat and, and Shalini because, I mean, I've been pretty engaged in, you know, these requests coming in and, and reaching out to them. So I have I have some opinions, but I'd rather hear from you too. Or Jennifer. I mean, I would I would like to go ahead with it, but I know it's um I mean I'm just trying to think it'd be in part because Mandy said, you know, this might position people so in terms of the applicants, they'd be going through all this for a short tenure, but it may position them better if they want to apply for full time. For us, it means we go through interviews now and then five or six months from now. Yes. Pat or Shalini? I still think that's a good idea. Um, I was trying to find the names that aren't in the public packet yet 
on SharePoint and I haven't been able to find it. I'm just curious um, who, you know, and I am concerned about diversity, um, but we have a limited pool. Five is not very many people, but it is enough to secure three associates. Shalini, any thoughts? I I guess uh, it makes sense to speak, speak with Steve Judge and see how urgent it is, because if it's not, then um, I wonder if, again, we can do a more focused uh, reach outreach. And I don't know. It's just like we're so stretched thin to do the outreach. Otherwise, it seems like Amherst College or Hampshire College and UMass there have to be people. In fact, I did meet at the South Asian Festival, a young woman. She's from Pakistan and is in the urban planning and showed some interest. So I actually reached out to her. I haven't heard back, but I, I'll keep pursuing her. So I just feel like people just don't know about these opportunities. And how do we do a better job of somehow, you know, beyond our district newsletters, because those go to the same people. But if there was a way to reach out to the universities through the chairs of the department, maybe Steve, I know he's busy too, but if there was a more systematic way, I'm saying, of, and somehow just sending random emails don't work, but it's like that one-on-one, -on -one, like I had, hey, you know, you can contribute if you're interested in this. And she's like, yeah, actually, I'm really interested. And I'm like, so somehow, how do we do that? I don't know. So maybe the suggestion, and, and we would have to actually formally vote to declare the pool sufficient, but maybe the suggestion is to vote to declare the pool sufficient, start polling the known applicants for an interview date that might be a little later in December, um, you know, such that we aim for maybe appointments at the January meeting, something like that, that gives us time for Pam to reach out to Steve Judge and see how urgent it is, um, for us to solicit the SOIs and see of those five, whether we actually get five. We've had, we've seen in past that sometimes we have seven, eight applicants and we end up with three SOIs, right? You know, even though they said, yes, I'm still interested, right? We have no idea. Um, but it would also, you know, it would at least move the process forward. We could then determine, we could then talk before SOIs are distributed when we know exactly how many met um, to see potentially um, whether the pool is sufficient. I, I worry that, so one thing I worry about in terms of getting SOIs in and then revisiting sufficiency of pool, if people have read SOIs, and I will say when I get them in, I don't read them until they're in the public packet. I, I open them up to make sure they comply with our rules <laughs> of 50 words or whatever that limit is, and I close them again. Because um, I think it's unfair for me to get them a week before you guys get them, say. Um, but maybe, if we, what I worry is if the SOIs are out there and we're discussing sufficiency, it goes to more than people's opinions of the candidates then go into whether you believe the pool is sufficient anymore. Um, and so that's why I hesitate to revisit sufficiency once SOIs are received, unless no one's read the SOIs. And then we're still looking at numbers and demographics and all, which I think is a fairer way to say, yes, we have a sufficient pool or not before we look at who they are. Um, thoughts on sort of trying to move the process forward while also keeping it nimble like that to revisit some of these once we have more. Pam. Um, yeah, let's see. Let me lower my hand here. Um, I, I, I think our job is to fill slots on the ZBA and planning board. That is what this group is supposed to do. So I, I do agree with Pat, it seems like we really need to move move on this. So it's now the 17th of November, and I can certainly reach out early next week um, or tomorrow, but I'm shuttling my husband to a procedure, so it may not be tomorrow. Um, but let's just say early next week, uh, a request goes to the five people that have expressed interest still and and say, please, you know, send in your 
statement of interest. I give them the whole packet, which needs for the rest of you. It's the uh, request for statement of, statement of interest. It's a little description of the ZBA itself. Um, help me out, Mandy. There's there's another item or two that gets sent to them it's to read. The it's the um, interview interview question. Interview questions go out before the interview, um, which is why we'd have to deal with the interview. We we would have to be we start with sufficient interview process. Interview questions go out before the interview, um, and so we would have to adopt those interview questions at the next meeting, depending on when the interview is. We have to adopt them a meeting before the interview happens. Um, and so the other thing that goes out is the, what do we call it, the criteria, um, the selection criteria, which yeah. at this point is the same ones we had last, last time. Um, yeah. GOL is still in the process of looking at different things. Um, that criteria we would use last the, the, the July's, June's criteria um, for that. And and I can also reach out to Steve Judge and ask him about at it. At the mean, same, yeah. Sorry, Pam. That's it. Yeah. And at the same time, we reach out soliciting SOIs. We have to have an SOI deadline, but we also have to ask for availability on specific dates for interviews. So I could I could start that interview availability tomorrow. Um, and and that's a what we tend to do is just a doodle poll for specific dates and times that includes all the committee members and all of the applicants. Um, because sometimes we're offering dates that aren't on our schedule um, as a committee. Um, so we need to, and and I always prior, prioritize getting all the applicants there. Um, sometimes it takes a while, but I could start that process tomorrow. Pat and then Shalini. I want to be sure that we don't have the same kind of kerfuffle that we had before. Um, so if we have an interview date and we get some new people before that, they can't make that date. We are responsible for setting up another interview, either separately for that person. I just don't want to see the same kind of flap that we had before. <clears throat> Okay, um, Jennifer. Yeah, I agree with Pat. And I think last time we got in, it was a little bit was summer vacation. So I don't want to get too close to holiday when people are likely not to be able to make it. So here's, here's what I will plan on doing lessons learned, right? Um, we can set an interview date, the pool doesn't technically close till the SOIs are due, um, or actually till they're posted on online. Um, and so so what I can do is if the committee wants to ensure that doesn't happen, if we get additional applicants between additional CAFs between now and when things are posted online, they immediately get the whole packet from either Pam or I and with a submit your SOI by this deadline. Um, and then that, in, that email also includes, and here's the intended interview date, are you available? And last time we ran into the, oh, I'm not, and I think it was like a day before the SOIs were set to be posted and all. And I, I really didn't know what to do, right? Um, and so I think my plan now would be then to reach out to everyone and say, we need to reschedule the interviews, yeah. retake the poll, um, would, would be given, given the desire for that not to happen instead of saying, oh, no, we already set the date and you're not available. You can't be an applicant anymore. Um, I think that's that would be what I would do is potentially move the interviews to a later date to find availability for everyone who submitted an SOI, if that sounds good to the committee. Shalini. Also, could uh, Pam, could you send us a packet also that you're sending out? So if you're reaching out to residents, then we can share the same set of documents. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, they would all they would really need to do is submit a CAF unless you I mean, but definitely I could I could include those documents. Yeah. yeah just so they know the criteria, the charge, anything that we need to tell people like what because generally people like what is expected from them and things like that. So they would still have to submit a CAF, but you could reach out with that information. Um, so I'm going to make a motion to declare the pool 
the applicant pool sufficient? Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, Athena, I'm gonna add a word to that. We always add. Um, declare the pool, applicant pool sufficient to move towards soliciting statements of interest and scheduling interviews. That was more than one word. <laughs> that was an entire phrase, sorry. <laughs> to move toward? Um, towards soliciting statements of interests, interest and scheduling interviews. Thank you. Uh, is that okay, Pam? Oh, okay. great. <laughs> Since you were the second. Any oh, further discussion on that? Like why ask me? <laughs> I've seen none. We start with me. I'm gonna say yes. Um, Pam. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Melanie. Yes. Pat. Aye. That is unanimous. Um, with that, we are over time. As I said, we are not dealing with residential rental bylaw. Um, we need to open to general public comment. Is there any general public comment at this time? Um, those attendees, I apologize to all the attendees. They just all left. I tried to make known we weren't getting there, but maybe none of them were here by the time I made known that we weren't getting there. <laughs> they were both for that one. Um, I tried to. Um, so we now have no public for public comment. Um, they can yell at me later. Um, but um, <laughs> that, um, and then we don't have discussion items. We have the meeting schedule. Um, did anyone have concerns with the meeting schedule or is it possible for us to quickly vote that and the minutes before we adjourn? I do want to note that I changed the January 2023 dates from the last meeting schedule to this one on the meeting schedule. Um, I'm not sure why. I, I changed them because they were bad to begin with. Um, so just a note on that. Are there any questions on the meeting schedule? I had two when I looked at the town calendar on holidays. Um, the first one is Passover ends on the day of our April 13th meeting. Is that, um, if we run 4.30 to 6.30, is that problematic? Um, Passover's last day is the 13th. And I just don't know. It does seem like it could be problematic for people who wish to um, it, um, is attend it, the meeting. If it's you not, have a Seder the second night, that would yeah. be problematic. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we'll look to, I'll, I'll look, look at alternative dates for the 13th. And then September 7th, um, Jan Mushtami, I might have pronounced that wrong, Shalini, um, is the 6th to the 7th. I ask again, is that a problematic schedule then? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. That's <laughs> sweet. Thank you. I looked at all of them and marked the ones that I was like, huh, these are the starter end dates of holidays. And I wanted to make sure. Uh, Pam, question? I was I was going to make a motion to accept the the proposed meeting dates with the caveat that, you know, if we see something coming that doesn't work, that we adjust it. Because <laughs> I okay. haven't to look at my, you know, complete life for the next year and a half. And, and adjust the April 13th to avoid yes. 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 Okay. Is there a second to that very general vague motion? Second. <laughs> second. Um, any further discussion on that? Seeing none, we're going to vote. We start with Pam. Aye. Uh, Jennifer. Aye. Uh, Shalini. Yes. Uh, Pat. Aye. And Mandy is an I, that one passes. Um, I will publish a new one with Passover adjusted, um, that 13th adjusted one week before or after. Minutes, any questions on the November 3rd minutes? Seeing none, I'm gonna make the motion to adopt the November 3rd meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Uh, we start with Jennifer. Yes. Shalini. 
Did Shalini freeze? Shalini, minutes vote. Hello. Yes. No, now I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye and Pam. Aye. So they are adopted. Thank you so much for your uh, patience as we got through and ran a little bit late. It is 6.40 p.m. and um, we are up adjourning. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.